Yeah. Okay. How many of you write the notes of the website? Okay, so the way I hope will work for this course is that generally the notes that are on the website, they're just there to guide the lecture, right? They're not going to be a replacement for the textbook. So any of you who've taken my other courses may know that the notes are pretty comprehensive. It's not like that in 3P. In 3P, the notes are just really information that I want to make sure that you get down correctly. Right? So if I write it up on the board, do this. So in 3P, anything I post is certainly there just to add to. It's not going to be a replacement for the textbook, and it's certainly not enough to make sure that you've got all the material. So if you don't have the notes, it's not that critical printed, but in general, the notes should be brought to class so you can add extra information to the work. So let's talk process control. Is process control only for chemical engineers? Who else takes process control? Mechanical? Mechanical? Electrical? They all learn process control. So when you go and work, you're not the only person that knows about uh, feedback, feedforward, disturbances, bus transport, first order system, and baseline. They'll also be very, very conversant with that terminology. In fact, there's only two courses that you take for us in this university that only chemical engineers take. Okay, one of them you're doing now is reactor design and the other is separations. Every other course is taken by other engineers. Okay, so reactor design and separation courses are the only unique chemical engineering courses. So process control here is something that other students also take and other colleagues that you work with you take. They'll have a good understanding. So it's important to recognize that because it's such a wide area of application. So let's, uh, maybe one way to start this class is let's talk about some systems that you've seen before. What uh, systems have you experienced that have been bad? Thermostat or a house? or a house? If that looks like here in the is a thermostat. Any other feedback control systems? Someone mentioned the yeah. refrigeration. 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 In what context? Fridge. Or oh, in your fridge at home, right? So it will kick in if the temperature isn't where it needs to be. Any other systems? If I use analogies of driving a car, how many of you people have driven a car? It's not a shame to be not driving a car. We're from the city of the region, we don't go in car. So if we talk about cars and bicycles, there is natural feedback over there. We want to maintain our speed and our position on the road. Uh, we have feedback systems, and we'll, we'll talk about that in today's class. Today's class is all about feedback. What makes, what makes up feedback? What elements are in a feedback control system? So, Let's talk about that. What, what do control systems do? Okay, so what does a control system do? So if we take this example over here, this is your temperature in the room. And you can see what's happening here. Temperature is fluctuating between 18 degrees and 22 degrees. So we can guess that somewhere maybe at 20 degrees Celsius is what the dry temperature is, but the temperature actually never stays exactly at 20 degrees. Then we have down here what we call our manipulated variable. And this we sometimes see the called the NV, the manipulated variable. Now in the top there we have the CV, the temperature. These are two very important terms. We're going to use them in every class for the rest of the semester. And when you go out and work, typically that's the same name terminology that companies will use as well. Control variable and manipulated variable. Okay, so the furnace, uh, uh, sorry, the room temperature is your control variable. The manipulated variable is the amount of fuel that's applying to the furnace. So what's happening here is this fuel is on, and there's a ramp up in the temperature. And the moment that that fuel valve shuts, so we've exceeded 22 degrees Celsius, that fuel valve goes shut, 
and remain shut for a period of time, the temperature in the room starts to slowly decrease. Okay. It gets to 18 degrees Celsius approximately, and then the fuel that was opened again by the thermostat. So we have these two variables going. In process control, we'll always see a C V and an NV, and we'll typically plot both of them on the same axis so that we can see how the C V and NV interact over the time. So those are two important terms, and that type of plot that you see up there right now, you're going to see over and over again. Now, is that good control? Why not? People who are saying no. Any suggestions why that you might consider that to be bad control? It seems inefficient, it's on and off. Okay. I did say that it seems inefficient because your stop starting, stop starting, and this. The system isn't being, it's not being operated smooth. The equivalent of driving a car and you put the gas pedal down and you take your foot off the gas, put the gas down and you're kind of doing that. Right? No one likes that sort of driver. Um, so that's that's one aspect. Any, anything you can say about the control variable? Not at your Okay, you're not at your desired temperature very often. What would we like to see? Straight lines. Okay. Now let's consider the practical side of this. Does it really matter if the temperature is doing this for a room? Will you notice this? Okay. So it may not really matter. For the purposes of this control system for a room, this might be quite okay. So the objective of this control system, this might be acceptable control. For a chemical plant or a reactor where you want very careful control, this may be unacceptable. Okay? So we're going to, in a few classes from now, start to talk about how we judge a control system, but this is a good start. Here. We're going to see what we, consider, what we can consider to be a good control system versus a control system, and what characteristics we take into account. So what do control systems do? Well, the first thing is there's an objective. It is to achieve what we will call the <coughs> point. There's a new term over there that you may not have heard before. We'd like to achieve a set point, or we'll sometimes say, maintain a set point, in the case of this, this room temperature, we'd like to maintain the temperature in the room that's roughly around 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's the first requirement for a control system. Now, if we're looking at, let's talk about a, a, a room temperature, what else do we need? We've, just, we've already figured out we need a set point where we want to be. What else do we need to make this room remain at 20 degrees Celsius? Okay, sensor. Anything else we're going to need? Your like maximum room temperature. So the markers of when the fuel should turn on and off. Okay, the markers of when the fuel should turn on and off. Okay, so there we can maybe call that part of the algorithm, okay. part of the decision-making process of, of that. And then implicit in Daniel's answer is, is the final aspect, is the fuel itself. Okay, so let's take each one of those up one at a time. We need a way to measure. Okay, so. We need a sensor to measure. what we want to control. And then thirdly, we need an algorithm or some sort of calculation.
Okay, so in this room temperature example, the algorithm is very straightforward. If the room temperature exceeds 22, turn the fuel off. If the room temperature is below 18, turn the fuel on. It's a very simple if-else algorithm. If the temperature is between 22 and 18, just keep going whatever you were doing before. Okay. So as long as you're between this, this 18 and 22, you just keep doing whatever you were doing before. So the fuel valve remains shut. But now we get to below 18, the rule says turn the fuel valve right. on. So I do that. Once I'm between 18 and 22 degrees, I, the rule is just keep doing what you do before, which is keep the valve where it was. It's a very simple rule-based system over there, and that's in fact what we call on-off control. And that's uh, diagram. <coughs> if you're driving a car, let's take that analogy. This is a different example. You're driving a car, and your goal is to maintain a set point, let's say 90 kilometers an hour. You have a sensor to measure what you want to control. You have your, your speedometer telling you that. What's your algorithm for calculation? Okay, how much gas do you give your car? I think you're jumping ahead to number four, which is implementing the control. Okay, but there's something missing in between there. Between the speedometer and your foot on the gas. Okay, you're thinking in your mind. What are you doing in your mind? A whole bunch of if statements. Okay, it's a very complex algorithm to drive a car, which is why it takes us several months to learn how to do this, or weeks or days, depending on the skill. It's not a straightforward algorithm that simply says open and close the fuel pump through your pedal, because we take into account the road conditions and all sorts of other conditions in the environment around you to make the decision. It's not just a straightforward um, algorithm like the furnace control. So an algorithm or calculation here, let's just put a note here, can be simple or pretty complex. One of the reasons why we don't have, have self-driving cars commonly available. They're in research mode at the moment, and they're going to be available in our lifetime. But right now, the complexity of a self-driving car is, is enough that we don't have them readily available yet. Okay. Then the final element is we need to take an action. Okay, so to take action, Let's uh, use a little bit more of scientific terminology there that we'll see in textbooks. We call that the final control element. Okay, and it's typically a valve. So here the fuel valve opens and shuts. If you're in a car, it's your pedal on your gas pedal that you're manipulating a fuel valve to take the action. So those are the four elements of a feedback control system. So let's take a look at that um, in the context of actually driving a car. If you have the slide in front of you, you can add to it. So let's, um, let's just put this over here. So if we're driving a car, we'll consider that as our example. And we have several inputs that we can consider and several outputs. Okay, so one of the outputs we are considering here is speed for a car or a bicycle. It doesn't really matter um, what your analogy is here. Okay, and an input to manipulate speed would be fuel amount. That would be an input. 
Another input that you could consider in a car is the angle of your wheels. So let's just write the entire angle. So the angle at which your wheels are at, that's going to be used to affect one of the outputs, position. There could be all sorts of other inputs into your car. Let's just write one other one, for example, the outside temperature. The outside temperature, that may affect one of the outputs, for example, your engine temperature. Your engine temperature is going to be a function of all sorts of other variables, but one variable that will impact your engine's temperature is the outside temperature. So let's see, if we're talking about a feedback control system and we've got over there on the left the four requirements for a feedback control system. Let's talk about speed then. Our set point, we've got a speed set point, let's say 90 kilometers an hour. So that's our desired speed we'd like to go at. we would need to measure that speed. So that's my first entry is my speed set point. The second one I need is a sensor for my speed. So we take that sensor over here, we measure that speed. And we'll bring that speed across. And we'll just write here controller. This is in fact your brain. In this particular example, your brain is the controller, and what you're doing is you're taking the set point into account. You know that you'd like to be going at 90 kilometers an hour, but you're also taking this information from the sensor on the dashboard in front of you that's telling you what your current speed actually is from the sensor. Okay? You're taking both those inputs into account, and you're going to then adjust in some way fuel valve through your gas <coughs> You're manipulating that fuel and we call that our final control element. So that's the fourth entry. So there's all four elements of the feedback control system over there, over a car. Now I said you can also exchange this analogy of, of riding a car with a bicycle. Is that correct? Do we have all those elements for a bicycle? Do we have the four elements for a bicycle? Do we have speed? The sensor? Your eyesight. Okay, so we don't have a physical sensor on most bicycles. We don't have a physical sensor telling us what our speed is. But what are you doing? You're, as, as you suggested, you were using your eyesight. Okay. Is your eyesight, is your eye a device that can measure speed? Not accurately. Okay. But what we'll call our eyesight is it's an inferential sensor. It can infer what the speed is based on how fast things are going past you. And you've got some experience growing up from a baby to at the current age where you've got a good idea of roughly what speeds are. Okay? So your eye is an excellent inferential sensor. So in many processes, we may not have a sensor that can measure exactly what we want to measure. But we can often find another variable that's a good approximation, at least good enough. We call that an inferential sensor. But in many cases, we can measure. We can measure temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, viscosity. There's hundreds of sensors out there okay, that can measure exactly what we want. But there's going to be some cases in your career where you say, I wish I could have a sensor that could do X, Y, Z, and you don't have that, or it's too expensive. Right, some of these sensors cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
Okay. So sometimes we'll find cheaper alternatives that can do that. Okay, so a feedback control system, however, must have those four elements in some form or another. Okay, so let's uh, just put up two definitions then on the board to help us. We're just going to define what control is and we're going to define what feedback control is. selected variables uh, selected variables that's my manipulated variable the valid position so that's what control is about it's not telling us how we do it all we know is we would have some desired condition and we want to adjust some selected variables. But how we go from that measurement to the manipulated variables, so how we go from the CV to the NV is what this course is all about. Now feedback control. That's using the output of the system. adjusting the steering wheel. Okay, so in both those instances we're wanting to measure, or, sorry, we're wanting to control something, either our speed or our position, and we're going to manipulate an input of the system, either the fuel or the tire angle. Now notice one thing, there needs to be a cause and effect relationship here. If I adjust the fuel, open and close, that's not going to necessarily change some of the outputs. Okay. In this example of the car, adjusting my fuel will in fact change my speed, it will change my position, and it will change my engine temperature. Okay. So by changing this one input, I can actually change all three of these outputs. But my tire angle, if I adjust my tire angle, in other words my steering wheel, I can adjust my position, but it's not going to adjust my speed, and it's not going to change my engine temperature. Okay, so there's no cause and effect from this second input from the tire angle to those outputs. So we need a cause and effect relationship there between our inputs and our outputs. So let's make that final two notes, and then we'll do some examples together. Just two important notes. A causal relationship must exist. Okay. So we're comfortable that fuel, for example, 
will affect speed. And important, when we say there's this cause and effect relationship, it doesn't work the other way around. For example, speed does not change the fuel. You cannot, by changing the speed of the car, the fuel valve is not going to change. So the cause and effect is one, one, one way. Adjusting the fuel will affect the speed. So we, when we're designing a control system, we're picking cause and effect relationships. So when you want to adjust the level in a tank, you can vary or manipulate the flow into the tank or the flow out of the tank. There's a cause and effect relationship. <coughs> and then one other minor detail that catches people out sometimes from terminology is that the terms input and output that I've used over there on that diagram, inputs and outputs over here, they don't, there's inputs, there's outputs, they don't necessarily refer to material flows. So the tire angle, for example, is not the flow of an amount of material. In our chemical process examples, Inputs and outputs are often material flows, but they don't have to be material flows. So inputs and outputs, let's just make that note here, not necessarily material stuff. So for the people in the back that cannot see that, that last line says inputs and outputs are not necessarily material flows. Okay, so let's take a look at an example then. Take a look at this diagram. And I'd like you to discuss with the person next to you left or your right, or whoever you prefer, and answer the following question. Identify all the control systems in that diagram. So get started on that one. Identify all the control systems in the diagram. working in a company, the engineers don't have time to help you and train you and tell you everything. They hand you a P and ID of the process and they say, go figure it out yourself. So there it is. There's a P and ID of the process. Figure out what's going on, what are the control systems, what are the four elements of the control systems, and what's the cause and effect relationship in every one of them. So this absolutely happens. The day I started working in companies, no one has time to tell you everything about the process. 
tank and that's related to the level in the tank. Okay. So there's many level sensors, there's some ultrasonic level sensors. I will post links on the website that will point you to various technologies to measure level and we'll do some of that in the tutorial. Yeah, if, it's, if you're measuring the weight of the tank, that's an inferential way to measure the level. Okay, so we've got some way to measure the level, that's our second entry. The third one. Controller. Where's the controller? <coughs> That's the C over there. You see it's referring to the fact that this level measurement is being used in a control loop. The actual location of where that control system is could be three kilometers away in another building and then the signal sent back. This diagram isn't here to tell you where everything is geographically. This diagram simply tells you this level is used in a control calculation somewhere. So there's your third entry, and your final entry is, or your element, is your valve, your final control element. That's this valve over here. So there's the four elements of that control system over there. Let's take this one over here for temperature. What's the first requirement is a set point. Right? So we have some desired set point for temperature in mind. The company will have documentation elsewhere that tells you that you want to operate this tank, for example, at 56 degrees Celsius. And they've determined that that's some optimal operating temperature. So there's your set point. Where is the control system? Uh, sorry, the, the sensor is on the tank. Now, is the sensor exactly at this location on the tank? Not necessarily. The sensor could be located near the bottom of the tank to make sure that there is always in contact with the liquid. Or it could be some way up the tank. But this indication here doesn't necessarily mean it's on the side at that location. 
picture of the diagram that illustrates we're measuring some form of temperature. How do we measure temperature? Thermometer. Thermometer. Thermocouple. Thermistor. Thermistor. Okay. Again, many different technologies to measure temperature. We'll talk about some of those in the tutorial. So you've got your sensor now. Your control loop is here again. There's your C. And what are you manipulating? <coughs> told here, um, and this diagram is using non-standard symbols, so we're not sure what the mechanism is, and whether it's heating or cooling, but it's clear that you're opening a valve, so that indicates it's likely going to be a liquid flowing in here, and it's either a heating medium or a cooling medium, for example, steam or chiller. Is there a cause and effect relationship there? Absolutely. If we open that valve, what's going to happen? If that valve is open for steam, it's going to heat up the tank. So there's a cause and effect relationship. Then the final one, we see this oftentimes. What is, what is the purpose of that control system over there? What's its purpose? Okay, constant flow coming into the tank. Okay, what if the operator decides, I don't want 100 meters cubed per hour coming in, I want 120 meters cubed per hour. So, the operator says, over time, here's 100 meters cubed per hour. And now operator wants to go to 110 meters cubed per hour. We call this a set point change. The operator is making a change in the set point. They want to go from the previous set point of 100 to a new set point of 110. What would we like to see happen? So if my flow into the tank was, was doing that, so that yellow line represents the actual flow measured by that device over there, by that sensor. What would we like to see happen? Will the flow shoot straight up? If we open that valve, will we get to 110 right away? Okay. What's going to happen? What, what would you like to happen? What's actually going to happen is, or maybe we might even see, that happen. Okay. Which one's the most preferred? The yellow one or the orange one? The first one or the second one? Okay, we're going to answer those types of questions in the coming classes. Right? What's considered good control and what's bad control? If you're driving on the highway and you want to go from 90 to 110 kilometers an hour, do you want to go like this? 90 to <laughs> okay, we don't want to do the same thing to our processes either. Right? For the same reason you don't like that happening to you when someone else is driving, you don't want to have that happen to you, a chemical process either. Because that abrupt change on the process does exactly the same what it's doing to your body in the car. It's throwing you around and it's very un undesirable. Okay, so smooth changes, smooth operation is desirable on the process. Okay, <clears throat> let's uh, just look what we've said over there. We talked about set point changes. So this was a set point change. Okay. 
notice what we've what's happened here. We've now said that our control system is doing two things. The first, when we started this class, is we said that we were writing our control systems. I believe the, the, the term that someone used earlier was saying we'd like our control systems to have flat lines. I think he even said we want flat lines. to be operating sort of around set points. <coughs> Why is the process moving around? Why is the process not actually horizontal at set points? Any guesses or any thoughts on that? Why is the process, that yellow line, not actually exactly on the set point? Okay, different variables affecting the process and we cannot control all of them all of the time. What we call that in process control terminology is disturbances. Okay? That is disturbances or changes affect our process. So that's goal number one of a control system. We'll call disturbance rejection. So the, one of the primary goals of a control loop is to reject disturbances. By that we mean we want the control system to make sure the disturbances don't have a big impact on our process and keep us close to something. <clears throat> that same control system will also have a second goal. And that's for set point changes. So to make set point changes. Okay, so if we ask why is control necessary, control systems achieve two goals. The first is to reject disturbances, the second one is to make set point changes. Let's go back to a car analogy. You're driving along at 90 kilometers an hour, and you're keeping your foot steady on the gas, so you're going roughly at 90. Then the road starts to go uphill. Okay, maybe a 10, 20 degree incline. If you keep your foot on the gas exactly where it was, what's going to happen to your speed? It's going to drop. That's a disturbance. You've just hit a disturbance. The, the level of the road is not what it used to be. Okay, so if your process, in other words, your foot on the valve, on the gas, stays where it was, you'll move away from set point. Your speed will in fact drop off. So you're driving along, you're going at set point, and then as you hit that hill, your speed drops off. So what do you do on your manipulated variable? Okay, so there's your foot on the valve. Okay. What do you do now to your foot? Push it down, open the valve, send more fuel to the system. Now you may do that kind of like that. Okay, and what's going to happen to your speed is it will go back to set point. Okay, so that's a disturbance. You have rejected a disturbance and tried to maintain constant speed by changing your valve position. So then you get to the top of the hill and it flattens out again now 
What's going to happen if you keep your valve open at that position? Power's going to speed up. Okay? So you're now at set point over here. And if you keep your foot at that position, you're going to speed up. So what you do is you take your foot off and go back to slightly lower and you send that to your clock. Okay, back to set. Okay? So that's disturbance rejection. Set point change is what we spoke about earlier. If you're going from some low speed to a higher speed, that's the set point change. So a control system has two objectives, disturbance rejection and set point changes. And here's the key thing. When it is trying to do achieve both those goals, it's using the same manipulated variable and the same control variable. So the same control loop and the same algorithm needs to be good at achieving both goals. So you can make a control system achieve goal one really well at the expense of goal two and vice versa. Our aim in this course is going to be to create a control system that can do both relatively well. Okay. Or if the objective of the control system is to only do one of these tasks, we'll make sure it does a task really well. Okay, so that's the, those are the key points for, for this class, is the four elements of the control system and what are the goals of the control system. So then the final thing I'd like to just quickly show you is what these control systems look like. So you probably see these sorts of pictures before this whole room. Here's a picture courtesy of Honeywell, with the guy sitting at a table monitoring lots of, of plots. So that's how control is actually implemented in, in a chemical plant. Um, here's a video of it to help just see it in context. We have, we have A, C, D, and E full pressure going right now. Going down here we have the condensate system. The condensate function monitor and the water levels through the A condensate story. The boiler drum here and the boiler feed pump. If you look at the screen, you can see you have one boiler feed pump run. The other one is down here in magenta. That is actually locked out right now. Speed monitors, air flows, fuel flows right here. Okay, so let me just pause it here. You can, uh, if you go to YouTube and you type control rules, you can get tons of these types of videos. But the main thing I want to emphasize is that those computer systems are not only doing process control, they're also running alarms, and they're also a way for the operators to open and close the valves without going to the valve physically. Sometimes the valve might be in a dangerous or inaccessible location, so the operators can change those valves from the controller. So that's how control is implemented. Next class, we're going to look at some of the other objectives.